So, in turning to Twilight of the Idols, I mean, it's helpful first to ask ourselves, what are idols? These, as Nietzsche presents them, are, are a culture's most deeply held beliefs and values. Nietzsche takes culture to be one big incubator right, for individuals, and the quality of these dominant belief structures is the, term, the determining factor for a culture's production of what he calls great individuals, those who are able to take hold of their destiny, shape their values, shape the world to fit their will. Right. Um, we develop um, these metaphorical understandings through our beliefs and values, and um, it, these metaphors are, for the most part, spiritual structures. We develop these to help us strive and thrive. In a sense, what we're doing, right, and one of the most powerful weapons that a human being has in terms of their natural survival, is the force of belief passion and conviction, right, and the ability to create these healthy metaphors by which we can live our lives, right? So we, it's us, who develop these values and beliefs, right? These values themselves are neither true nor false. Uh, they're metaphors by which we get along in the world. That is, they're helpful, or they're not helpful, right? This is how Nietzsche proposes that we, we evaluate these idols or beliefs. Right? Nietzsche uh, claims that our dominant metaphors and spiritual beliefs are now at a point of twilight. That's illustrated by that passage that I just read you. That is, many of them are just worn out and just don't prove helpful to us any longer. So, we should, as accordingly, be critical of these metaphors and revise them in order to form a healthy spiritual disposition that will allow us to thrive in the world. Right? So this project he calls, um, and this is in the introduction to Twilight of the Idols, a revaluation of all values. Right? Now, there's a problem, though. We find ourselves in a bit of a paradox right off the right off the bat here. All right, uh, we're able to be critical of these idols or values as uh, how you know how are we able to be critical of these idols as individuals? All right, Nietzsche seems to take it for granted that we can be and are, but. If that's the case, how then, if uh, our individuality is to some extent produced by these cultural idols, who I am, what I believe myself to be, the various options that make up my life, right, are given to me by these idols or beliefs, right, um, if, if that's the case, right, how, right, by what means am I to be critical of these beliefs. My individuality right, is, at least theoretically, the source of my ability to be critical of these values, but these values are productive of my individuality. Right? So we've got a bit of a paradox here. Right? So this is why we need to, um, as Nietzsche says, philosophize with a hammer. Right? Now, Big crazy Nietzsche on the cover of your portable Nietzsche here, right? This is this is a cartoonish sort of representation of Nietzsche, but nonetheless, right? Uh, what we what we would like to picture when uh, we notice that the subtitle to Twilight of the Isles is how one philosophizes with a hammer, right? Um, well, we've got to figure out what this hammer is. Right? It's, it's easy to picture Nietzsche with a sledgehammer knocking down clay statues of our, our previous gods and idols and beliefs and values, right? But that's not really what he's getting, um, getting at here, right? It's really easy to picture this mustache figure of Nietzsche just smashing clay idols with a hammer, right? But this is, this is a mistake, right? He tells us that these idols are touched with a hammer as with a tuning fork. Right, in the introduction uh, to this, this, this section, Twilight of the Idols. Um, and he calls this a sounding out of idols. Right? So, this 
enough. If anybody's a music major or knows a music major or has Google, right? Google tuning fork, right? And what you what you find is that tuning fork and tuning hammer are the same object, right? And what's more, what you find is that the a tuning hammer is something that you hit and it rings a true note, right? To see if you're in harmony, right, with this true note, right? So what Nietzsche wants to do is examine our idols, our cultural presuppositions, um, the basic fundamental presuppositions behind um, how we give our lives meaning and value, right, and see if they are in harmony. If they are, great. They don't need to be altered, right? Though, if they're shaky, if they're not in harmony, they should be in a sense, pushed over. Right? So we can substitute new values in their place. Now, with regard to Nietzsche's, um, well, atheism, right? what you're going to find in Nietzsche that he is, he is an extremely spiritual theorist, right? but at the same time he rejects this Christian notion of God. Right? Now, what he is getting at here Right, is, well, it's a basic sociological claim. In human history, there was a point b before we believed in the Christian one true God, no gods before this God, a perfect, absolute, all-knowing, all-seeing, all-powerful creator who is benevolent and a persona. Right? There was a, a point before we believed this. There was a point when we started believing it. And now, historically, culturally, socially, right, we're hitting a point where we no longer believe this metaphor, this narrative, this place, uh, this way of understanding our place in the universe. We just, we don't believe it anymore, right? Nietzsche's not claiming that there aren't believers, right? In fact, if, if we go straight by the statistics and the numbers, we're going to find that there are more believers today than in Nietzsche's day. Right? And Nietzsche's not claiming either that, that these believers right, don't really believe what they claim to believe, but rather he's, he's making this cultural sociological claim right, that has to do with how we split religion, right, our religious life, and the rest of our normal daily lives. There's a division here. Right? Religion is something that we do on Sundays. The rest of the work week, uh, the rest of the life week, our relationships, everything else that makes up our lives is separate from this religion. Right? Now, both Nietzsche and Kierkegaard claim it cannot be so. Right? So, right, we find ourselves right off the bat in um, a, a spiritual crisis again with Twilight of the Idols. Right. Now, um, in the first opening sections, I'm going to leave it to you to read through some of these. Um, I am going to point out one, um, <laughs> one very, uh, very, you know, popular uh, maxim. Um, it's right off the bat. Uh, you've probably heard of Nietzsche, right? If you've watched a Superman movie, the idea of the Superman is a Nietzschean idea, right? But you've also probably heard a number of his adages, right? For example, uh, maxim number eight from Maxims and Arrows here, on your page 467, reads out of life school of war. What does not destroy me makes me stronger, right? So you might be surprised to hear that this old adage that we rip out of its context and misappropriate all the time actually comes from Frederick Nietzsche. So it's there. If it's ever a Jeopardy question, you've got that. Now, what these maxims and arrows are supposed to be are almost like Buddhist cones. It, it, these, these sort of witty um, daggers of insight that we're supposed to meditate on and get more out of. Right? But um, for our purposes here, what I'm going to do is turn to the first argument that we find in the problem of Socrates at this point, right? Then we can go through 
we can analyze this argument. And in fact, we're just listening, uh, looking at the problem of Socrates, reason in philosophy and morality, as 